Welcome to Straight Talk. A federated farmer survey reveals a strong rise in confidence levels in dairy farmers compared with a year ago. But sheep, beef and grain farmers are still pretty surly, with their expectation that things are likely to be worse in the year ahead. All three sectors intend to increase production and farm spending, but meantime they say they want to reduce debt. How will they do it? The Feds are giving the thumbs up to the government for its Productivity Commission Bill, with its first reading in Parliament. How will farmers tackle the hurdles ahead? And what are we going to do about all those overseas buyers targeting our farmland and agribusinesses? Today I'm joined by economic commentator Brian Gaynor and former agricultural journalist turned journalism lecturer Dr Alison Usterman. Now Brian, uh, dairying looks to be the star of the show at the moment. How are the other sectors going to catch it up, if in fact they uh, possibly can? Well, dairying has been uh, the star for quite a while, and it, it all comes back to China and Southeast Asia, the demand for protein there. They don't like our red meats that much, but they are very interested in our dairy products. And really what is driving us in Australia over the last few years has been China, the demand for products from China, and what the Chinese want, we are moving towards supplying. Mm -hmm. Are we in danger of becoming too reliant on China and too reliant on those dairy exports to that market? Well, you could say that. I mean, there's always a threat. I do think our dairy exports are reasonably well diversified, but we can't deny the role that China is beginning to play in this part of the world. And yes, we are vulnerable to them because, say, for example, they decide for some reason that they don't want our products or there's some kind of a, a trade controls on them. I don't think there will be, but if there was, it would make us very vulnerable. But at the moment, you have to go where the demand is, and the demand is very definitely Southeast Asia and particularly China. That's where the growth is, and it's the growth of most of our food industry except red meat because they don't demand red meat the same way as they do some of the other products. But as their diet becomes more westernised, uh, maybe the uh, interest in red meat is going to follow uh, in the footsteps of the interest in dairy products? Well, we have a lot of work to do there because their tendency is to favour poultry and their tendency is to favour fish and that, so we have a lot of work to do. It's much easier on us on the dairy uh, side because particularly for their young children, they do want the uh, dairy products for the young children to make them grow and to make them taller than they are at the moment. We have work to do on the red meat side. I, I don't dispute as but they become more westernised, they will have more red meat and say for example wine is not an industry with potential to China mm -hmm. but at the moment it's very very small. Right. Now Alison you're from a farming family. Are dairy farmers right to feel uh, as optimistic as they appear to do at the moment do you think? They're a bit bipolar I, th I suspect because they're optimistic at one minute and then <laughs> the international scene changes and then it becomes more pessimistic. I think a good barometer is probably the rural towns mm -hmm. and they will, how they're doing will reflect how the uh, dairy farmers are doing. Right. Uh, I'd like to see them thinking a bit more long term rather than you know this season and then the next season. Right. What about more long term and the impact, uh, you know, sustainable farming? Mm. Because I it has always been the way to live from sort of one mm. Fonterra payout to the yes, next, hasn't exactly. it? And base everything on that. Mm. Um, what about with the uh, sheep and beef farmers and arable farmers? Uh, they are getting some longer term trends, if you like, aren't they, from uh, marketers of their product. Do they have uh, a better opportunity to uh, take that long-term view or is that why they're feeling more surly perhaps? Well, well the impression is that, that they don't seem to have the mood swings that the dairy farmers do. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're less optimistic than uh, dairy farmers. Uh, mm. They must be very envious of what's happening I think in the dairy industry. Well uh, dairy farmers always used to be regarded rather as the poor farming cousins, didn't they? Mm. Uh, and how the, how the situation has now changed. I remember my father as a dairy farmer at Waitower um, would talk very negatively about how poorly dairy farmers were treated and I remember as a child writing a letter to the editor <laughs> supporting his stance which I thought was quite funny. Good on Age you. 10. <laughs> now Brian, uh, rural debt, that's been very much in focus uh, over recent times. Um, farmers are intending to uh, uh, cut their debt. Um, they've been successful thus far in uh, reducing some of that enormous overhang? Yeah, to some extent. But remember, debt reduction is, is, the, is the name of the game around the world. It's not only farmers, it's households, it's everywhere. And certainly the farmers are, because the financial institutions are forcing them to do. Financial institutions don't have the same amount of money available as they had a few years ago, so they're forcing all borrowers to reduce their debt. And we're, we're definitely seeing it in terms of the rural towns that Alison talks about. We're not mm. seeing the level of spending 
in those towns that we normally would have with the type of payout that the dairy farmers are expected to get this year. I mean, you look at some of the companies like PGW Wrightsons, which normally would have done very, very well through their mm -hmm. merchandising outlets during um, this type of period, but they're not doing that well, mainly because the farmers are repaying debt rather than spending the money. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing a very definite change, mainly because the world of finance is changing. The financial institutions don't have the amount of money to lend and they want some of the money to be paid back, some of the borrowings to be paid back. Is there any uh, indication of a change out there with uh, rural lenders based on the fact that uh, the dairying signs are now um, more positive than they have been or is it pretty much uh, slow and steady as she goes? Well what was happening in the past is we were tending to get the banks uh, lending against first mortgages. So say for example a farmer uh, bought a dairy farm for four million they might get 2.8 million from the bank and then they would get another million from a finance company like South Canterbury Finance. Well, the finance companies are gone to supply that second mortgage. Mm -hmm. So what it means is farmers are having to um, to raise more equity to pay mm -hmm. because they're not getting the second mortgage they used to get from, from the finance companies. So the obliteration of the finance company sector has made a huge difference in terms of the financing of the purchase of farms because banks won't lend 90% to purchase a farm. They never did really. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the, uh, with the exit of the finance companies, it is going to be more difficult to get full debt funding of farm purchases. Right, so uh, that could be a good or a bad thing, couldn't it Alison, depending on uh, the stage you're at, at your, in your farming career. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a youngster who wants to go share milking, you want all the money you can get. Mm. If you're an older farmer, perhaps uh, it's quite good that uh, you don't have the avenue open to buy that flash tractor that uh, you might have your heart set on. What about the older farmers who want to get out and there's nobody there to uh, follow on? I think mm. that's probably an issue too. Mm. But what I can't understand is the Crafer farms is how did that bank allow them to run up 200 million debt? Mm. Well, it happened over quite a <laughs> yeah. considerable period of time, didn't it, Grant? That's uh, right. right. Yeah, it did. It happened over a considerable time, and I think the banks won't allow that to happen. Your banks go on cycle. They're quite oh, amazing. Right, it's yes. the old story oh, yeah. about they give you an umbrella on a fine day, and they want it back when it starts <laughs> raining. And that's exactly what's happening with banks at the moment. So there's no question the banks made mistakes with the Crafers and with others. They're much less likely to make those mistakes over the next few years. So yeah. the Crafer type of person who comes around the next few years and wants to borrow 200 million won't be able to get it. Mm. Because because at least they could have got something from someone like South Canterbury Finance, but those, those organisations are certainly not going to be able to give in the future, so they're going to find it much more difficult to get the funding. Right. Now what about the uh, sudden concern that the Prime Minister is uh, displaying about uh, Chinese interest in uh, New Zealand agriculture? This has been around for a while, but John Key seems to have uh, just got with the programme. Yes, I think, I think it's quite amusing that um, he seems to have jumped on the band wing and without realising that the band probably doesn't know the tune properly. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Brian? Yeah, well, it's going to be a big issue. You know, I see this, uh, I've seen it with the banks back in the early 1990s where the Australians spotted the opportunities and bought all our banks and it happened in forestry. All our major forest mm. estates are foreign owned at the moment and now the Asians are seeing the value in our dairy industry and our dairy farms. So we are going to get a wave of overseas purchases and it, I, I like that we're having the debate because mm. I think it is very important that we discuss these issues. Mm. I mean, I'd love us to develop uh, an ownership society where we felt that New Zealanders wanted to own their own assets. Mm. And it's always been one of my bugbears against the country. We seem to be a bit too willing to sell. I wouldn't, be a I wouldn't support a stop overseas people buying. I prefer it that we decided that mm. we wanted to be an ownership society and we wanted to own our own assets mm. rather than have rules stopping overseas people from coming in here. It is a good debate to have. Have though. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you think that the uh, review that the government is having of the uh, Overseas Investment Office, do you think that's far-reaching enough, or as Brian says, it needs to be a wider debate?